ready? Everyone seem ready? Okay. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our panel session titled Making Space. Uh, in this panel, which is the fifth and the final panel of the sessions we've had at Art Now this weekend, uh, we're going to look at the works of a gallerist, artist, uh, educator, and administrator, and um, examine how they pay attention to the community and then work to make open and welcoming and inclusive creative spaces. My name is Jessie Campbell, and I have had the pleasure of curating the panel discussions at Art Now this year. Art Now is organized by Sask Galleries, which is a provincial organization that supports and promotes the work of commercial galleries in the province. And SAS Galleries has worked hard for many months to realize this event, so I just want to thank them for all that they have done, not only to make Art Now happen, but for the many initiatives and projects throughout the year that support visual art. So thanks to SAS Galleries. Our panel and the entire Art Now event are taking place on Treaty 6 territory. And this is the traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. I make this statement as a settler, and um, over the last couple of years, have really come to understand the advantages and the privileges that have been afforded to me as a settler on this treaty space. And I've learned a lot about that through the work that um, artists and curators and writers and educators of Indigenous descent have shared, so I really value their expressions and their communication and, and what they have shared in their artwork. And I also realize that this can't just be an empty formal statement, but in order to be meaningful, it has to be accompanied by, by real action for social justice, for the rights and privileges of, of everyone on this land. Um, I just want to give you a little bit of an idea of how uh, this session this afternoon will look. In just a moment, I'll introduce our panel, um, and then they will have a conversation for approximately one hour. After their conversation, there will be time for questions. So if you have something that comes up in their conversation, uh, please just wait until the end, and there will be a chance to, to make a comment or a question for our panel. This panel is being live streamed, so a special hello to everyone tuning in via the internet. Very happy that we can connect this way in this digital age. And the panel is also being recorded and it will be uploaded on the SAS Gallery's YouTube page um, after the event. So I would like to introduce our panel here, and, and actually just a quick note before the introductions. Uh, if you saw some of the promotional material, you may have seen that we were to have Alana Moore as one of our panelists. Unfortunately, Alana uh, couldn't be here at the last minute today, so while we will certainly miss her contributions, uh, we will, I think, still have a very rich discussion. Um, and we are very, very grateful to Alexa Hainsworth, who is stepping in uh, to share uh, some of her work in this topic of making space. So I'll actually start by uh, introducing Alexa. Um, Alexa um, has many roles in the art world. In addition to being a fiber and installation artist herself, she also works at the Saskatchewan Craft Council as the member services coordinator and in that role um, works very hard to interact with both members of the council and art enthusiasts every day. Um, in her practice, she creates large and unusual installations as well as costumes. And um, she has done, I think, wonderful work throughout the community. And I was just remembering, Alexa, a couple days ago that I got to experience one of your works in Prince Albert a couple years ago uh, in a domestic setting. So yeah, that was actually a really cool experience. Emma Anderson. <laughs> um, Alexa is on the board of AKA Artist Run, and she is also a member of the Bridges, Bridges Art Movement, which is located in downtown Saskatoon, and we'll be speaking um, a fair bit about Bridges today. So thank you very much, Alexa, for being here. 
Ezra Forrest is a they, them, two-spirit and non-binary artist from Samson Cree Nation in Alberta. But Ezra is currently based in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. Their background in activism and Indigenous theatre has enlightened and elevated their passion for sharing their views with the community through art. They are the Wapaki Program Coordinator at Choke Cherry Studios, as well as an artist of many media, including singing, writing, directing, acting, designing, and producing. So thank you very much, Ezra, for your contributions today. Uh, Levi Nicolette is our next panelist, and Levi is both an artist as well as the co-owner co of the gallery Art Placement Incorporated, and he's been in that role since 2013. Levi completed a BFA in 2009 and an MFA in 2011 at the University of Saskatchewan with a specialization in painting. He maintains an active studio practice, although art making has taken a little bit of a backseat to running a commercial art gallery. Levi is passionate about supporting local artists. He has previously served on the board of AKA Artist Run Centre, as well as on committees for SAS galleries. And recently, he participated in the 2022 EMMA collaboration, serving as the resource artist for the painting area. In addition to supporting artists through exhibitions, writing and sales, he is interested in exploring new ways to make use of the gallery space to serve artists and the larger community. And to that end, the gallery has hosted exhibitions, fundraisers, and other events for the benefit of several community organizations and not-for-profits. Finally, I would like to introduce our moderator this afternoon, Alejandro Romero. Alejandro is an interdisciplinary artist, facilitator, volunteer, arts administrator, and instructor. Alejandro has a passion for creating art, social engagement, meditation, and equine therapy. His leadership as an arts administrator includes award-winning public art, public performances, lectures, and public speaking. He has been artist in residence for cultural capitals in 2006 and 2007, artist in residence at the King George Community School from 2007 to 2008, and at the Green Olive Arts in Morocco in 2019. Alejandro is currently the public arts consultant for the city of Saskatoon, and he is also on the board of directors of Carfac National, the Saskatchewan Arts Alliance, Creative City Network Canada, and the Public Art Network. Thanks, Alejandro, for moderating today, and take it away. Thank you, and thank you, and welcome everybody to this afternoon. We're having uh, a good conversation to uh, this afternoon about uh, art and public space, and and it's a great opportunity to to talk like we are in our house, in our homes, very informal about the meaning and the importance of of public space and how can art can can bring people together. Uh, in, in that regard, I want to ask all of you, uh, one at a time, of course, uh, starting with Alexa, can you just tell us a little bit more about uh, Bridge Art Movement and the role in, in, in out space, public art space, space indoors and space outdoors, and what, is, uh, what are we working towards uh, in these times? Yeah, uh, so Bridges Art Movement is located downtown in the Drinko Mall. And um, we are a team of artists who have kind of given our space to the community to, to really use our, our gallery for um, projects they have in mind to relate to the community. So the, the works that are being done take place over six weeks, generally. Um, it's an idea generating space. It's a place where the community can come at no charge and participate in what whichever activity is going on at that time. The, the gallery is always transformed, ceilings, floor. There's always very interesting, exciting things happening. And um, recently, the most recent show that we've done was uh, Global Gathering Place came and, and did workshops in glass fusing, knitting and crocheting, uh, painting and um, it the the turnout was amazing the reception for that was 
everybody's families from Global Gathering Place got to come and uh, see their, their relatives work, um, which was you know, a new and unusual thing for them coming to, coming to Canada and being able to, to participate in something like that. So um, I thought that was very right on. Uh, we are donated, we are given the space by donation from uh, Dave Denny who owns the building so, th so that we, our costs for the space are low and then we do go out and get grants so that we can provide artists with fees to get materials or to pay themselves for their time. Um, thankfully, our placement has also been so generous in giving um, mat money for materials to, to our uh, programming there. So um, we started in Riversdale and ended up in, in the downtown, but I think that the, the future looks bright and exciting for what's coming in the fall and spring. Ezra, same question for you. Can you repeat the question, please? Yes, it's about uh, what is the role of Chalk Cherry in the public space, and tell us a little bit more about uh, how do you navigate the, the public spaces and, and the work that you do with artists, and, and, and what, is the, what is Chalk Cherry about? Uh, Chalk Cherry Studios is located on Avenue J South. Um, we currently rent the upstairs and downstairs of a space on that avenue and art happens in that area in um art happens in the in the building and we do public art installations that we do with our art and our art is focused on indigenous activism and inclusivity thank you levi same question yeah so um art placement for anyone who doesn't know, it's it's a business. Uh, it's located in downtown Saskatoon at 228 Third Avenue South, just a block down from um, the Drinkle Mall where BAM is. Um, but art placement is a lot of things. Uh, it's a commercial gallery, and here at Art Now, that's kind of the face of the business that we're representing. Um, but art placement also has a frame shop. Um, it also has this art supplies store. So it serves artists in a lot of ways and it connects to artists in a lot of ways and um, has an opportunity to kind of touch a lot of different artistic communities because of that, not just commercial artists who make work to sell, but also uh, you know, students, um, hobbyists, uh, sort of artists of every level and, and age, from kids to, to adults. Um, and I, I guess in terms of like, so art placement is a long standing business, actually we'll be celebrating 45 years uh, next year in 2022 and uh, my partner and I we took over in 2013 so it'll be 10 years next year for us and um, uh, I'll just throw it out there like I, th I think privilege is uh, you know an important word and it's always informed uh, how we think about what we do in the gallery and um, how we undertake the running of it because we were very privileged to take over a long-standing business that was well established and had a really strong reputation in the community and uh, that kind of just underpins like everything we continue to do is um, uh, again like I just think how privileged we are to be able to exist to have this uh, opportunity to connect with the community and service it um, and though it is a business so we don't I mean we'll maybe get to talking about a project we've done where we did secure some grant funding uh, but in general, we're, we're a business, so the, the, the business survives by generating its revenue, um, and we live in a capitalist society. Uh, but um, yeah, our approach is always about, um, we, we really appreciate those who patronize our business and support us, uh, and so we uh, consider it a privilege and an opportunity for us to give back when we can too. So um, it's, it's a reciprocal relationship, and that really, um, yeah, informs how we approach everything. So, um, yeah, uh, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And and you touched two important subjects as well as Alexa and and, and Ezra about privilege. We live in colonial time, and there's a, an interest and a movement to decolonize the systems. It's very hard when we live in a in a system that is capitalistic microphone that sorry 
we live in a in a bis in in a world that is very capitalistic. That's the model, economic model that we follow. So there's sometimes difficulties to navigate and create accessibility for works of art for people to participate and take experiences in 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 the art practice as well as as the opportunity to create uh, the space safe for all different communities that have been marginalized for a long time. What, what do you think has been your successes in, and I mean successes in a very broad way, uh, not necessarily economic, but through participation, through receiving grants, through uh, being present in the community and being noticed the work that you do. What, uh, can you just Tell us a little bit about uh, how have you engaged into that decolonizing and what projects have you led or worked with or supported uh, in order to just contribute to this decolonizing and also create the awareness that we've been a capitalistic privileged work and then we have to support the other people that are not with the same privilege. I will start with you, Levi. Yeah, so uh, again, I think we exist in this capitalistic society, so um, we're not going to overturn that immediately or perhaps ever, um, but there's different ways to approach how you operate in that system. And um, it's a system of competition, but um, it doesn't have to be, or um, competition doesn't always have to be about, uh, like someone succeeding or winning doesn't have to have losers, you know. Um, and so, again, I think it's like, I, I like to think, uh, you know, there's a, a compassionate capitalism, right? Where, um, you know, you can succeed and have enough, um, but then when you, when you have enough, the extra can be used to support uh, those who have less. And uh, again, like, we are a business, so we, we can't do everything uh, we would love to do uh, or support everything uh, to the full extent or in every way that um, we would, again, in a perfect society, uh, wish to do. Uh, but we can do what we can when we can. And it's just about like always keeping that um, possibility in mind for us. And for you, Ezra? Uh, at Chokecherry Studios, we believe in inspiring artists from the core community to, exp to explore themselves in what they believe to be powerful to themselves. So by decolonializing art in the core community is just by having them exist as who they are. Um, Chokecherry Studios, we, um, our foundations are serving and helping the youth, um, mostly indigenous. 90% uh, of our uh, youth are indigenous, so just by existing as an organization that serves mostly indigenous youth. That is our decolonization. Thank you. Alexa, please. Um, well, I'm, I'm thinking about this in terms of the work that I also do uh, with the AKA as a collective. We call ourselves a collective because we're tired of looking at it as a board and we want to break down kind of the systems of oppression who are the people that we are serving? What is the community we are working in? Uh, how do we become a welcoming space where people come in and feel like they can be part of the gallery? Um, I would say that at each meeting we do our, you know, we check in with one another so we talk about what our day was like or what we're working on or um, how we're feeling about our time. And um, then we talk about land acknowledgement. And we talk about, um, we talk about it in a very also informal way, what we're learning about our land and the people who, um, who are, uh, are here and, and from all their walks of life. Um, so we, we talk about things in a very personal way, and um, we even use our technology to do check-ins and, and discuss ideas about what is important about art. What does art mean? Um, 
breaking down labels, that sort of thing, and, and saying that um, maybe locals only, which was one of the things that the AKA took part in, uh, was about food and about community and about reaching out to one another and doing those same things, check-ins, and learning about who our neighbors are. So um, we, call, we call ourselves a collective and we're doing work that is about ungovernance, really, breaking down those structures um, only bringing in new people on the collective that are uh, non-white, right? So um, I think we're doing really good work and I'm excited about the, the future of AKA as well and whether we call ourselves AKA. Well, that's a very interesting point that, uh, that you refer of decolonizing boards uh, we work uh, with institutions, we also uh, depend on institutions to give us uh, the collectives or the art practice, the dollars to, to work uh, and create this work and make it accessible. And there's a mandate by the government that this work has to be accessible. The work government is uh, rightfully so doing their best way, at the how they can, to try to to support this. It's for the organizations to just uh, look at the programs that they have and investigate research and then bring all those components in order for them to access these grants and this funding, which in the latest uh, years have been a, a, a very uh, a very strong uh, commitment for organizations to be more inclusive in their boards, be more inclusive in their governance, be more inclusive in bringing uh, indigenous voices and newcomers' voices, uh, not, not uh, changing the whole process, which I think it will take a little bit uh, more movement, but I understand that AKA probably is one of the, the pioneers in this process of decolonizing an organization and trying to talk a little bit more about how how this can 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 affect other organizations as well how did you see this happening in in, in the private sector well like for art placement we're privately owned so we don't have a board structure um, but obviously there there is a power structure you know there is an owner and then there are people who work there um, but uh, again, like we have a great team and we really value that team and it's not, uh, you know, a, a, well, I mean, at the end of the day, like it is a top down, there's someone who has more responsibility or more say, um, but we value everyone who's part of the team and everyone is involved in decision making and, uh, like Linda in the gallery or Melody who does the finance and Wynn who's in the store and everyone else who's in the store, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not about being the boss and kind of laying it down. So I think we just, um, yeah, like even in the way we, we have our, our organizational structure, it's, it's, it's not about authority. Um, it's about valuing everyone. It's about relationships because everything we do is relationships. Um, and especially in Saskatchewan, like community, I think like words like relationships, community, like those are just so important to everyone. Um, and there's so much overlap in all of the communities and uh, you can't exist or operate in this place uh, without considering and valuing those things. Um, it's, it's just critical because of the nature of this place. Um, so I mean, that's I guess the best we can do in terms of... Uh, Levi, you, you also have broken your gallery apart and brought in people to do their work and s studios and, uh, and biofeedback. Yeah, and, and we'll probably talk about, yeah, there's open studio, yeah. uh, pictures of the open studio week. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's about like an openness to, to others and to uh, trying something different. And again, we always have to keep that bottom line in mind, but whenever someone approaches us with a request or an idea or what about this, can we try that? It's, it's about, uh, you know, someone might take an approach of, you just say no, because that's the easiest thing. But uh, I'm open to having a conversation with anyone and saying like, okay, well, how could that work? Um, how can it work in a way that benefits all of us, right? Um, 
And, and yeah, so like Alexa mentioned, Open Studio was a project we did this summer. It's part of a larger project called the Community Project where we uh, collaborated with a local um, artist collective, Biofeedback, uh, comprised of three young women artists who are recent graduates at the U of S. Um, and again, just like, I feel so privileged uh, in existing at our placement and having these facets of the business. Um, I come from the store, like that's sort of how I came into the business before being the owner. Um, and I still uh, spend time in the store, not because I you know, don't wanna find other people to work there, but because uh, when I'm in that space, I get to interact and feel connected to uh, a, a much broader range of, of artists in the community than I would just existing in the gallery. So um, I will always spend time there uh, and it's given me the opportunity and the privilege to connect with those artists like Biofeedback. So knowing them uh, then, you know, leads to this idea to do this project, um, which, you know, started out as a, it was like, okay, you're a young artists, you've got energy and ideas, we represent a lot of senior artists in the gallery, like, you know, what do senior artists and young artists have to say to each other? What do they have in common? What do they have to learn from each other? Uh, and then, yeah, it was this larger project that kind of grew out of that. And Open Studio was one facet where uh, for a month in the summer, the gallery was turned into a workspace to bring together artists uh, of diverse backgrounds and different stages of career and just have them make stuff in the space because uh, a gallery space is a, a large open space that um, serves one function when it's a gallery, but it can be so much more. And what are some of those other things it can be and how can those still be uh, very enriching to artists and serve them uh, in more ways than just exhibitions and sales. I, th I think you've been very modest because for the longest time you have done a lot of uh, uh, things and in art placements. Uh, you also have access to materials that are considered uh, <laughs> for some other, other places that are, and I'm talking about the Montana paints and, and, and and street art materials, stencils that are accessible to a certain group of people that other might have considered them as bandos, right? So also another thing that I have noticed in uh, the welcoming in your galleries, you know, like uh, I'm a person that is a visible minority. I have never felt that uh, I go there and I have a, a <laughs> an attendant behind me because I'm gonna steal something that I have felt that in other stores. And I have heard the same comments uh, from my indigenous friends that they feel welcome in the store, that they don't feel that they have somebody and, and look at them a, a different way because they're indigenous and then they're there to steal. So I think you have done your work and you have uh, created that environment. Uh, it's a different way to decolonize as well. Um, and for you, Ezra, uh, uh, you are an indigenous organization, indigenous voices, core neighborhood. How do you, uh, through partnerships, how do you engage the other communities in order to bring that reconciliation together? Uh, at Cho Cherry Studios, we're very youth-led. So we let the youth lead the conversations. What they need is what we provide for them, what we hope not what we provide, but what we want for them to have. So the youth, should they feel that they need something at Cho Cherry Studios, it is our responsibility to help them get there. So with our partnerships, we like to think of it like, like they're close, like, like almost like a family member because at Cho Cherry Studios, we're a very young organization and we, uh, we firmly believe in who our partners are, so we let our youth lead that conversation. What they need is what we provide. How, how the name Choke Cherry came upon, it's, it's a berry, right? And it chokes, so <laughs> it is interesting because it's, it's not liked by a lot of people, a Choke Cherry, but you chose that as the name of the organization, so uh, what can you tell us a little bit about that? That's a story I'm still trying to find out. <laughs> Well, I know that uh, your work might have been uh, in invested in social activism mm -hmm. and it, it are public installations that people are welcome and they have a little bit of a, a, a co-creation in the process and how people participate also co-create in the whole process. Uh, you have been in, in invested in, in, in few projects in the city. Can you just give us an example of one or two projects that have been 
successful in terms of reaching people that you might thought that you wouldn't touch? Yeah, we had an Action Council Canada Day on July 1st. Um, as you can see here, we have a photo of a youth making a medicine pouch. Um, our art installation that we did at Council Canada Day was a community uh, community involved art installation where everyone tied a tobacco pouch to ribbons that were hanging from a tree because there is no art installation in Saskatoon that represents the missing children at the residential schools. So uh, at the end of our action at Council Canada Day, we had the community um, receive tobacco ties from each of the youth at Choke Cherry and the community took turns helping each other tie these tobacco ties to the ribbons that we hang from the trees to honor those that did not return from the residential schools or also those that went to residential school. So that was something that we did. And the tobacco ties, we made a thousand tobacco ties. We made 500 that were read to honor the missing and murdered indigenous women, girls, trans, and two-spirit. And we also made 500 for the residential school survivors as well. So we hung a thousand tobacco ties that day. And it was such a moving experience because everyone took their time with it. And it was ceremony, which is something that I wanted the community to experience at Choke Cherry because at Choke Cherry Studios, we are very indigenous focused. Everything that we do at Choke Cherries is to honor where we come from. And the art installation that we did was to represent our commitment to the community. Thank you. And, and, and Alexa, I know BAM has been through a lot of different phases, uh, but they have kept the, the core of, of being accessible and, and bringing very contemporary fun projects. Some of them have included even animals in, in, in some of their exhibitions. And then you've been active participating also in, in festivals uh, that are more for a larger audience that is not only the artis artistic audience. How did you go through a process of, 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 of being inclusive at be and also being uh, selective uh, in the process of curating what goes and what get exhibited and when? Mm -hmm. oh, well, I think we could always be more inclusive. We are um, all white facing groups, members of BAM. But I feel like everybody who participates in uh, doing an exhibition if, or a community project, um, tho those people are also, I feel, members of BAM. So if, you, if you've had a show with us, you're, you're, you're part of our team, I, I believe. And here we have uh, uh, Brody Burns, who uh, I think he was just about going into his uh, BFA program at the U of S when, when he did this show and um, again, transforming the gallery and using you know, his, his heritage, his background, his color sensibilities, his thinking about you know, nature and the expanse of how we're connected, these power lines, um, was a really beautiful and touching work. I was really pleased when he came in to, to do this work that I, uh, I tapped Kevin Pace on the shoulder and said, you know, um, we're going to have this person come in and, and do this work. Would, would you meet him? Do you know, do you know about him? And uh, I, connect, I, I feel really great when I can connect people together. So uh, they met and I think that they went to um, an Alberta show to do, a, to do a, a fair together of work. And um, so pleased to make that connection for both of them. Um, yeah, we've, we've done things in the downtown, postering, uh, so bringing, bringing art to the outside of the building as well. And um, I, I don't think we hardly said no to anybody who wanted to, to give us an image that we could put up. And some of them were quite provocative and powerful and meaningful to, to where those artists came from. And it was such a big group of artists, I think maybe like the 22 people or something like that we're able to to put work on uh, on the street then and then we do fun things and invite people like uh, the oh, there's the posters and 
uh, Levi was great and he put them up for us and sold them so that artists could take home a little bit of money. And of course, we got a pussycat on the right there. So we had S Street Cat Rescue come in and we just built like cat towers and painted funny things and made cat toys and, and let people come in and pet kittens <laughs> and maybe take them home. So uh, there's always something different and unique and that people can feel unafraid to come in and spend time with us because it is always so joyful and colorful and um, it's about the community. Yeah, it's fun projects and, and, and it's good to insert some of these new ideas and, and strategies to, to just engage with the community and, and just try to bring different audiences too because uh, with art is something that comes from the spirit but also it has uh, some social, social impact and it also has some political impact. How do you see that uh, the work that you do, and probably this question would be more for, for Alexa and Chuck Cherry Studio, but also uh, perhaps for you too, uh, in, in, in the way of, of, of how do you sometimes can select uh, an artist and create an artist that can push sort of an ideology or, or a political idea or, or social justice into the system, because I know it is probably a little bit harder for you because you depend on the sales and, and, and it's, you have to, that's part of the business. But you also have been an artist uh, and understand the, the hardships and the tribulations of how to contact with a gallery and, and being declined and be rejected, right? Because your work is, might be too political or too, so it's not a saleable work. So how do you make space for, for artists in, in, in those regards? Um, well, uh, yeah, so we took over the gallery, but we're not of the same generation as the previous owners, right? And so um, my artistic identity or, you know, my background in the art education I had, um, it, it, it's different than the previous owners, and um, it, it can't help but uh, perhaps have, have made me more open to um, art that... Uh, yeah, how it can be more political or um, something that, again, it's, uh, I'm so honored to have taken over this established gallery that had a great reputation and, and had a very particular focus. Um, and we considered our responsibility to honor that tradition and honor that, that history, um, but also, you know, a responsibility to carry the gallery on into the present and, and the future. So um, can't be uh, not in tune with uh, work that is happening now um, and, and a lot of that work is more political or um, it's not necessarily not that there's anything wrong with landscape painting and landscape uh, is also a, a hugely political topic so um, uh, and even abstraction like uh, the choice to make abstraction can be seen as political I mean uh, all art I suppose is political uh, even if it's neutral that's a, a political um, position, um, but definitely, um, yeah, I gave a bunch of images of all kinds of things that we've done at the gallery. Um, two highlights that I guess I would talk about, though, is uh, that, I mean, immediately after we took over, we, we did uh, connect with and, and start showing new artists' work. Um, uh, one of those artists that, again, we're, we're extremely honored to work with is, is Ruth Cuthand. Um, she was interested in working with us. We were, of course, honored to work with her and represent her work. Um, and so, yeah, we are, I guess, diversifying the, the gallery roster, but um, it's also not pursuing those artists just to diversify for the optics of, of that, right? It is about still maintaining, you know, uh, standards of quality and excellence, um, but being open to broader types of work. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that's just by virtue of who we are and the background we have and the time we came up in. So um, Donald Byrd is another artist. Um, he's a Saskatoon artist. And like in 2016, uh, we did a show of his. And um, I, I don't need to get too deep into his biography, but um, he's a person whose life has a lot of challenges. Um, but he makes work that is Amazing. Um, he, I guess you could say he's a naive artist. He, he's not trained, um, but again, like he, he's prolific and he produces this work that just speaks to someone who has like 
um, an incredible personal vision um, that he's expressing through his art. And uh, yeah, so it's like we got to meet him through the store. Um, again, he's, well, I won't get into, I don't need to get into all of um, his biography, but um, he's not someone who would ever find his himself or his art necessarily in a commercial gallery, but um, the work deserves to be there, so we gave him a show, and we continue to show and represent his work, and um, yeah, I'm very proud to do that because the work is great. Um, so I'll stop. Thank you, and um, Chuck Cherry, of course, uh, it is, about social inclusion, activism, uh, decolonizing, but also it, it broadens and it opens the eyes of people. What are some of the tactics that you use to, to bring uh, some of your background in, the, in theater and, and stage design and all those things and music into the performances or the tactics or the activities that you chose to use in order to touch people? in the way you do it with your work? Um, so at Choke Cherry Studios, our youth come to us and they make Choke Cherry what it is. So when it comes to selecting artists, we don't select them, they select us. And the youth with like, I'm, I'm, I'm very strong in the word youth because that's what Choke Cherry is, is a very youth led organization. We serve youth from ages 11 to 29. Um, and the work that we do, uh, social justice, social activism, um, everything that we do at Choke Cherry is for uh, listening to the voices, amplifying the voices that are from the community. Everything that Choke Cherry does is political in a sense that we are trying to get these stories and these opinions out there because the community needs what Choke Cherry has. Um, when I was hired at Choke Cherry Studios, yes, I had a background in theater, um, but my, my dream was to bring my art to Choke Cherry and help the youth learn about what other ways they can express their art. So, um, we like we do workshops that like the WAPA Gay program uh, is based on uh, anti-oppression and anti-racism art workshops. And in my theater career, um, just a little bit of a background is all the shows that I've done have been of political nature to raise awareness and to amplify the voices of the community. And that was something that I wanted to bring to Choke Cherry Studios. Um, and at Choke Cherry Studios, we. Uh, we, we, we try our best to, to, uh, to decolonialize the system that is in Saskatoon um, because at Choke Cherry Studios, there, we try not to think of it like there's like a level of everything, like level of um, who has the higher voice than other people. We have our goal and our mission and instead of like it being like up, 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 like we have it, everybody in a circle having an equal chance to be heard and an equal chance to speak and to represent their art. Thank you for that, and, and, and that's a good, ex a good practice for every other areas and every other fields uh, where for century has been top down, and there's always the head, and then all the others have to do their work. I think there's some power in, in the process of sitting on a circle, and everybody's at the same uh, ground level, equal, equal boundaries for everybody, where everybody has the same opportunity and time to connect and to care for one another, and then it is a collective process. It is not the work of one person, it is the group of the voices of a lot of people. And that's a great uh, opportunity for, for, for reflection and, and an invitation for other organizations and an invitation for other groups and inclusively government just to think differently of how we relate to one another. So thank you for some of those uh, practice and tactics. And, and for you, Alexa, uh, in, in VAM and, and all the work that you have done as an artist and what you have brought to, to, to VAM as, as an organization and, and your trajectory as an artist, uh, you do fiber arts. There's not a lot of that is non-traditional. 
And in, in, in that process, a lot of people are not uh, in touch with some of those practices. There's a lot of education in order to just bring across uh, your ideas and, and the topics that you bring that uh, at times, uh, most of the time they're very powerful, but you do it in a very subtle, gentle manner that is out there and then people go and they are playing because it's very playful and they don't even know that, that, that they work that you put in there. It's a little bit subversive, but it's a very subtle way. How, do, how is, can you tell us a little bit about that process? Uh, yes, so I became a fiber artist because I, I it's what I wear and uh, it's lightweight. And there's something about the materiality of the fiber that, that everybody can relate to in some way. So it, it's, about, it's about protection from the elements. And, uh, and so it gives people kind of a sense of security in that way. Uh, but yes, there is also something that is a little, a little strange. So it, I try to get my audience to come in and really question what, it, what is the material how are they feeling? How are they relating to my work? I want people to kind of exist within in the structure and become part of the artwork itself. Uh, I, I really like just going back even to to what you're saying about you know like si sitting in the circle um, and everyone kind of being on the same level. My my work. Um, uh, it, it's expansive and it makes you feel like you're f you're kind of floating in space. Don't I don't have an image of any of my pieces up right now, but that's okay. So they're they're really bright and really colorful and kind of canopy and kind of uh, biologic, and so that there's a relation to your to your body. And uh, I, I do feel like everyone kind of is on the same plane when they come in. That they are all kind of they're f all floating. And so they're, they're all, they, again, there is no hierarchy of, you know, you know, you have to understand it this way. Everyone brings their own interpretation to what they're seeing. And shadows and theater kind of play a part in that. And you, you know, you, you become the player. And, and, and in that process, sometimes you invite people to work with you in, in and they contribute, they have a contribution in this final piece. And, how do you navigate in, into that process uh, that they feel that they feel that the art is also part of them? Uh, well, when recently with working with biofeedback, they did it in a real way where um, I laid out lots of wild, stretchy and sparkly and colorful fabrics and people could pick and choose what they kind of related to and could build a, um, an installation with with each other. I think I ha we had a group of like 12 people um, cutting, sewing, and gluing things together, and then hanging it on an armature that I that I created in advance. And it was just really fun to see what what materials people were drawn to and how they would relate to it, and what kind of like how their imaginations would run wild, and and they could make little strange kind of pouches or creatures or stretch little things that would sit in this armature. So that was, it's just a really fun way of getting people to, f to play and let go and uh, yeah, again, be part of the work. So this, what I hear and what my audience can, can, can relate to is, this is community work uh, and, and in that process of working on that community work, the artist is leading it but it also have to surrender a lot of power. And, and, and there's a, a freedom that comes through that process as well to not, to not be too attached to these materials, to these material objects that we create and, and, and put out for public to evaluate and sometimes to judge. What do you think about uh, the public space in general when you put your, because one thing is when you are inside in your territory, in your space that you can choose to invite, but what about that space that is contested all the time that it is, it belongs to everybody and no one at the same time? And I start with you, Alexa. Uh, yeah, uh, it's exciting to see how people relate to my work when they are not expecting to. So like, you know, on the street, if, if I'm doing a kind of intervention or, um, or that sort of thing, it's, 
uh, I, I love the transformation and thinking about site specific work, um, how you can take over a space that maybe wouldn't necessarily be looked at. Um, you, you would glance at it and keep walking, but once you put something in, how that highlights um, that space. And uh, it's, it's intervening on, you know, the everyday is what it's all about. Uh, artists are activists and we, we make art because we want to be um, pushing boundaries and um, creating work that matters in this moment. Yeah, and, and for you in Chalk Cherry, how do you select that public space to do your activities or you're doing your performance or you're doing your presentations or your collaborative work? Uh, so at Chalk Cherry Studios, we have like a public space that we have upstairs, an art drop-in space. Um, and we have the youth come and do the workshops there. We have them make their art there, share their art there. Um, indigenous existence is resilience. And so by having the youth in the space, we already are making art and resilient against colonialism and genocide and all of that. Um, but one thing that we do is we go to different areas in the city to present our art. So last night I went to Nui Blanche and Cho Cherry Studios did a spoken word slash rap at Broadway Theater. And it was so beautiful to see the work that happens in Cho Cherry at another space. Um, because it is on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, um, it feels like everywhere that Choke Cherry does art, like it belongs there. Like it, it already, it doesn't, like Choke Cherry Studios doesn't need an invitation to have their art showcased. We make our art be seen and be heard just by existing as we are. I, I like that. Uh <laughs> that component that you said uh, to be seen and it belongs no matter if, if they don't need an invitation, right? Because art shouldn't be invited. Art, sh art is and it should be everywhere, right? So with in these terms of colonialism, I, I appreciate that work that is there and it exists. And if people don't want to see, they have to see it anyway. So that's great. And for you, Levi, you just, again, it's a little bit different when you run in uh, a gallery that is within certain boundaries of economics and certain boundaries of infrastructure that is its, its own and is private. But sometimes you just take the, the, the risk to go outside or open your windows to people to see. So then you are in, in any ways uh, curating. Have you thought of, of having the space or going out to a space that is not within your territory of the gallery? Um, not really, like quite honestly. Um, yeah, uh, I can't really um, speak about operating in public space in the way that um, the other panelists can. Um, but certainly like, even though it's a, a privately owned space, um, it's a, a private space that's open to the public. So, um, and, and again, like, space in a capitalist system has value. It has a cost associated with it. Um, and, uh, you know, what occupies that space uh, has a, a value judgment. So again, because we're a commercial space, we put up art and we put price tags on it and you can actually walk in and see like a very tangible monetary value to what we choose to allow to occupy that space. Um, but again, I mean, maybe it's come across that I'm a little bit like of a wary capitalist. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the way I have to operate in that system and, and I, I enjoy operating in that system, but also in um, doing things or creating opportunities or allowing things to exist in that space that um, sometimes complicate um, that value system and, and just being open to that. And I, I, I don't think that diminishes uh, what we do, it just like, it, it starts a conversation which I think is a an, an very important societal conversation. So uh, Absolutely, I think Alexa has a commentary. I was just thinking, well, you know, you, you work so hard to bring in, like uh, Alejandro said, is the materials that artists are using to create these works that are so important. And even when I say to you, oh, well, like uh, the Saskatchewan Craft Council we would like to do some framing of these pieces. We have members that maybe um, 
need a little help in doing the finishing touches and you do such a good job at like lifting those people up just by doing the, the, that kind of work and keeping your business alive and it, exactly that youth can come in and not feel um, like they're being followed or that they're, they're suspicious or what have you. Like you are so open and so generous and you give so much of your time to whoever comes to you and asks for it. It's really amazing. You're really too kind, but I, again, I think we all do that. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, we're not perfect. Like we are suspicious of people who look suspicious. <laughs> um, who are. But uh, yeah, I mean, we could always be better, but um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I truly believe in, in that philosophy of like a rising tide lifts all boats, right? Like if we can all succeed, then uh, we're all the better for it. And someone doesn't have to, someone doesn't have to lose so that someone else can win, right? I think, um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. This is a very interesting conversation and in that topic, uh, I have to, to go back to Chuck Sherry and Alexa because in their organizations that you both represent or, and work with and, and do your input as an, as an artist and creators indirectly, how do you navigate bringing across this uh, grants to the government that sometimes criticize the same work that they do all the time. How do you, how do you navigate the language to, to have the accessibility to these fundings that at times you depend on it? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't do so many uh, grant writing myself, but I do generate the ideas that go into it. Um, and how how we approach language and and trying to convince yes funders to to support projects like this that we do that are so important to the community. Um, I I think it's about honesty and transparency and and recognizing um, what needs arise and being able to um, change directions. Uh, when things maybe are, uh, hit, we're hitting walls, we can flip and s switch the script and um, be open to new ideas that work better for us and what we're doing. So it's about, it's about listening to one another and it's about, um, yeah, val valuing our work and our time and one another's time and recognizing like what, what do we want to see? What, what is the utopia? Um, and does it have to be like a utopia or maybe it's, um, it's a closer goal than, than we really think. It's about saying, it's also about just saying yes to ideas rather than saying what does, what hinders us? For, forget about that. Just, just go forward and, get, and try. Uh, I myself am learning how to write grants, um, but something that um, that I'm learning is that, well, like in the grant writing process, um, is that the government has a lot of work to do. They have a lot of promises to keep up with that they have to meet. And I think that with grant writing, it is holding the government accountable in a way that they need to, m to meet us where we're at so that we can get these services to the youth. That's, that's an interesting, uh, that probably my, the question that I've been boiling in, 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 in my head, in my mind. Uh, we talk about we and them, and at the end it's all us, and we are in this all together. And it is very important to just uh, acknowledge in both ends that we are in this together. We, we are the government as well in the sense that we pay our taxes to pay the salaries of the people that goes and work. So then we play both roles indirectly and we are all connected. And I think uh, these systems of power is what is separating people. Uh, and you mentioned, and, and that's what uh, the next question that I was gonna ask, uh, it was a perfect flow of, of it. Uh, because I was gonna ask what are some of the challenges that you find to, um, in the process of bringing your art outside in public space, the challenges that you find of bringing across the, the, the work that you do to a larger audience that can understand without judgment. Alexa, I start with you, please. Um, 
I think it, I think it's about yeah the the what what is power and what are the stakes of power and like what are the stakes involved in power dynamics and um, really really snapping it breaking it um, and and doing work with integrity. I don't know. Yeah, that's a that's a very important word, integrity. Um, I think one of the challenges is that um, sometimes people just don't want to listen. You know, like the art is there, the people are there, the artists are there, but some people are choosing to not listen. Um, I think one thing too that is a challenge for art in general is just that people see what they want to see sometimes only, and um, choke cherry art isn't meant for it to just be seen, it's meant for it to be heard, for it to be digested, for it to be in the spirit, in the home fire. So I think more willingness um, to listen and also more willingness to learn and to reflect more on how they play a part in on their side of what art is presented to them. And for you, Levi, it's, it's not about grants, but it is uh, in, in your process of, of what you choose to support, right? In, and I know you have supported a lot of people in the city and you're very modest about it. Uh, well, I guess what comes to mind is like the challenge when you have an established identity and then you, you know, start to do something a little different is you risk alienating, I mean, you're, you're kind of reaching out to a new audience and you risk alienating the audience you already have who has certain expectations of what uh, you do and will put out in the world and, and what you value. Um, and, and yeah, like it, it is, it can be a risk. Um, again, I, I don't think it's like we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater, right? Like, um, and, and again, I, I, I truly believe that Sask Saskatchewan is a, an art community that um, has so much overlap. Like there's, you know, students, there's like the commercial scene, there's like maybe public or, or artist run center. And like if you had a Venn diagram, they, you know, 95% of it all overlaps in the middle, right? Um, you see the same people out at, like everyone who supports the art supports kind of all types of art in general. Um, so uh, again, hoping that that's true, we we just tried to have, um, you know, a, a diverse program. So when we bring in something new, but we again can continue to value and support um, the things that have um, defined us in the past. So. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't necessarily think they're contradictory because I think art is like a universal language. And um, like Iris Hauser gave a talk in our booth yesterday and she, um, it was a fantastic talk. Uh, she does have a show coming up, it opens October 8th. Um, but, uh, you know, she talked about um, a particular painting and, and the sort of spe spe the specificity of her experience that inspired this painting, but how behind that very specific story there is like, universal um, experience or, or emotions that are kind of embedded in that, that people who, uh, you know, have, haven't had the same experiences as her, but uh, can, can feel or can experience those emotions in the work uh, that resonates true with them, even though they don't, they're not getting exactly, you know, what she um, experienced or, or the, the story exactly as she's telling it, but they're, uh, they're feeling something. And so, yeah, I think, artists, even if they work in d different ways, um, I think we have more in common and more to share and learn from each other than uh, differences. So yeah, art can definitely be something that connects people and um, yeah, that I, I think is how it, it works. Yeah, thank you Levi, great, great, great segue for the next question. What is, a what do you consider uh, in Chalk Cherry a successful art project or an art activity? I'm just trying to think of one. <laughs> um, I well, just because like there's so many. Um, one of our activities that we do um, is one of our successful activities that we do is doing a talking circle with the youth on a Tuesday every so once in a while. Um, and the talking circle that we do uh, is for the youth, and we do it in the community. Like we do it at Cho Cherry Studios, and. Um, I think it's art in a way that it's ceremony and we're all sitting in a circle talking with each other. Everyone gets a chance to speak, everyone gets a chance to listen. And the talking circle is so that the youth can 
bring what they can't normally say or what they're too shy to say is for them to come and say something that can help the organization serve them better. So when it comes to the talking circle that we do, um, it's art in a way that everyone is participating. Everyone is coming together. Like you said, art brings us together. And what happens from these talking circles is we build it into our programming. We build it into our organization. Um, and so by um, hosting these talking circles with the youth, they come to us with what they want, and we, we try to get that to them as best as we possibly can. And I believe that that's like one of that, that's happening in Wapake programming, and I think that's one of the most successful art activities that we do because it's ceremony that we're sharing within the community in the core neighborhood that uh, benefits the organization in a way that it benefits the youth mostly. And, and in that uh, talking circles, do you welcome people that are not indigenous? Yeah, so it's for our youth, and our youth are not just indigenous. We have youth of all backgrounds. So um, it's amazing that we get to share ceremony with everybody in the community. Yeah, thank you. It, I, I, I knew that, but I just have to ask. <laughs> Alexa, tell uh, us a little bit about what some activities that you consider that has been successful, and what are the components of that so-called success? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mm -hmm. think, yes, art, art becomes alive when we are able to tell our stories um, and when we think about what our future l looks like and where we want to be. Um, some activities I think that we've, we've done, even just, uh, you know, uh, um, it is allowing people to come to us with ideas that they want to do and, and saying yes again to those ideas. Um, when when the AKA just says yes, we have uh, solar panels on the on our building. We're we're just fine in in providing power outlets to a community fridge where people can come and get their lunch, and um, then are welcome to come and stay in the gallery and sit and talk and share those like ideas with us. Um, then we we feel very privileged to to have those experiences. Um, That's a great example of, of, of an activity that is very successful because there has been a lot of conversations about the gentrification of 20th Street. Uh, and whoever lives in Saskatoon know that it was a, a street that was highly regarded because it was uh, a lot of people from the East and the West divide didn't go to that area because there was a lot of crime just for the audience that is in the in, in, in online to understand what, what, why this is important and why this is a successful activity. Just a little bit of a content for the people that are online. And with democratizing and talking about democratizing, we are opening the floor for any questions. Um, any person that has a question from the audience that will want to ask any of these three excellent, great panelists. I don't know if we can get questions from online viewers, but if there's any, uh, we welcome them. So who has the first question? The microphone is in the center. If you please can say your name and, and ask the question, please. <laughs> Hi, my name is Taylor. So I specifically have a question regarding indigenous rights and equality. And it's what do you think the best thing for people like me who are not indigenous presenting, mainly privileged people, can do to be able to support indigenous arts? Is it just you know, going to galleries, or is there anything else that we can do to be able to support and share it? Thank you. Do you, Ezra, want to answer that? That's a really, really good question. <laughs> um, one thing that I've noticed in my art career is that um, if there's a space that is open that, that an indigenous person will take, that they're able to take, they'll take it. Um, so not many indigenous people see their own folk up in these spaces. Um, and I, I don't want to say create the space for them, but I would rather say move to the side so that they can come in. Um, as an indigenous person, I often grew up not seeing an indigenous person on a theater stage or in a TV show or have their art seen at um, an art exhibition. Um, and that's, 
to say that they, they like indigenous people want their art to be seen. They want their art to be heard. They want their art to be experienced and witnessed. And the greatest thing that you can do for an indigenous person or with an indigenous person is just to step aside so that they can fill that space because our voices are just as important and we're equal to everybody in the way that we have beautiful art to share with people. Yeah. Thank you. And, and another thing that I uh, could also, uh, and I'm not in indigenous, but I have worked with indigenous and I have listened to indigenous in so many consultations and I wish for many more because you learn a little bit more all the time. One of the things is just, there's some, uh, a, uh, an open document, an open working document that Carfax Saskatchewan has of indigenous protocols. And I think that's a good uh, toolkit to start uh, to engage and listen. But one indigenous elder told me, go and visit them, see them, become friends, invite them for supper, have supper with them, accept them as, as, as you would accept any other friend because they're not, we are not fearful, that's what they say, <laughs> we're not scared. Uh, and if you don't feel welcome, it's okay. Keep trying, keep trying. Usually indigenous people is very welcoming, but uh, just, just keep coming keep coming, keep coming, don't give up. They yeah. have to see it and they have to trust you because uh, uh, the relationship has been broken for so many years. But when it's open and it's legitimate and it is uh, respectful, then you are one of them. They adopt you as part of family. So it is very important to keep that in mind that it's not just show up. Show up and bring something to share, right? Like if you go to a, pot a potluck, just bring something. It's like coming to visit <laughs> them, just always bring a gift. It's good to bring your gift. And sometimes the gift is just listening and be open with kindness. Oh yeah. And and Thank you guys so much. <laughs> and also Taylor, you're, do you're doing the first step is in asking how can I can I support indigenous and, and black owned businesses? So you're, you're already there and it's all about, you know, edu just educating yourself and th about our history, I think as well. Oh yeah, thank you guys all so much, by the way. This was a really great panel. <laughs> thank you very much. Any other question from the floor? Okay. Just a little follow up to that last, at the 1980, uh, Four years ago at the 2018 Saskatchewan Arts Summit that was inside the, the Red Bear Center on campus, that question was in the air. Uh, there was a gathering of Saskatchewan art organizations and they were asking, what can we do? And it was much the same response. It was more heartfelt and anguish, but it was, uh, I paraphrase maybe, but it was this get out of our way <laughs> was the response. And it, but that question was in there four years ago and remarkably in the city there's been remarkable evolution uh, on campus. The kind of changing of the guard and the galleries there. Uh, well, it's a Wally Dion show and etc. But at the Reme as well there's been a remarkable kind of uh, evolution there too. And with Lyndon Link later, later there, and the, rec the more recent shows have been quite a sign of a positive evolution in that direction of making space for indigenous uh, artists here. Uh, my question is other. It's more on issues directly to most urban downtown cores, uh, residential housing and affordable housing. I know the Drinkle kind of deals with that directly. It is relatively affordable, and it's got quite a good model that deserves to be spread, to be propagated. Uh, that model of being open to creating a community of livable affordability in the downtown core, with the aspects of, of art-related events and galleries, and, and the mix of residential shops uh, Dave also has that business incubator, so there's an art incubator inside that one Drinkle complex. It's quite a model, it's quite a Saskatoon thing. Uh, I know Art Placement has a residential option on the second level. I just discovered that lately. It's quite a remarkable thing. I haven't really figured it out yet. It has the potential to be 
I mean, I looked at one unit, I thought, this is like my ideal artist studio space. I had no idea it was just upstairs from your gallery. At the same time, it's quite a, it's under a lot of pressure downtown with the imminent closing of the lighthouse. Uh, there's a pressure on, on uh, all sorts of housing downtown with redevelopment too. Ezra, you, you deal with the uh, gentrification in Riverdale quite a bit too? The, the uh, you're asking if we experiencing gentrification in the area that's, that the studio is on? Yes. Well. Uh, I am glad to say I don't think so yet. Okay. Um, it's not so close to downtown as, say, um, Riversdale is. Yeah. So, uh, but the location that Cho Cherry is at, we're very fortunate to have that location because it's one of the only places, if not the only, where we can have that space, where we can keep that space for the youth. Um, and many prayers to the creator that it stays that way, <laughs> that we get to keep that space yeah. because the youth need that, that space the most. And I hope that we get to keep that space so maybe even someday own it. Is there still a mechanic car shop on the main floor? Yeah, yeah. Um, we share the building with a couple other other companies. Um, yeah. our, our hope is that we get to have the whole building for, uh, for other programming and other purposes, but we do share it with other, with other companies yeah. as well. Yeah, I looked at that space about four years ago and kind of chickened out a bit because of the, the car shop downstairs, but uh, uh, good deal. Uh, I just wanted each of you just to speak to that, that uh, the quality of, of affordable residential housing downtown is kind of a backdrop for the arts community to have the resources to do everything they want to do uh, with their private resources. Yeah, I think, well, um, it, it happened with BAM that we were uh, in Riversdale and then uh, using it as studio and gallery and um, it was really great to be across the street from AKA PAVE while well, we could be because I think it made it more accessible for you to do like art walks. It's, I think it's, Riversdale is lovely because there is there is space for studios. There's painters, the um, future artistic minds, and Choke Cherry, and there's there's so much going on with young people just wanting um, a space to create um, and a, and and a place for people to meet. And um, it's unfortunate when <laughs> when we do get pushed out because uh, you know businesses want to move in restaurants and, and bars. That, that's hard, um, it, but we're fortunate that, yes, at the Drinkle, um, there's space available and, and people have been so generous to us to, uh, to have that space. And last night, seeing so many new spaces uh, in that mall that are more art-centered is um, exactly what we need right now. Uh, of course, studio space is so limited in their and affordability of studio space is very hard for artists. It is always a challenge. Um, I think the city needs to recognize that and uh, <laughs> maybe instead of a stadium, we can have a, a bigger arts hub. That would be uh, my dream. <laughs> Great segue. Next question, please. Thank you. Um. Mine is not a question, more is, is more a comment. Uh, I just want to comment about uh, kind of picking on, on some of, of the topics of the conversation about the different roles that we play in the art community. And I just want to say thank you for this, for this conversation. I find it really great to have uh, you know, participants of the community in different roles, you know, like as artists, art administrators, or commercial gallery, or or youth organization, you know, sitting together and talking as one, as we are one community. And I just want to say thank you for the conversation and of course uh, to, to Art Now for, for opening the space to, to this. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Gabriela. So now it's your turn to just ask questions between each other. So if, <laughs> uh, if Levi, you have a question for uh, Alexa or Ezra, just your, your first. What is art? Um, <laughs> no, uh, no, I mean, it was, um, 
it's been really nice to meet Ezra. We, we just met one time before when we sort of touched base, but um, I feel like I've gotten to know you a lot better by taking part in this panel, and I'm, I really appreciate that, so thank you. And Alexa, we know each other quite well, um, but we've never really had this conversation, um, or we've, you know, in more casual ways, but um, in any case, th it was really uh, enjoyable to, yeah, take part in this discussion with you. So I don't have a question for anyone, just gratitude for, um, yeah, the conversation today. So thank you, and thank you, and thank you. Ezra? Uh, no questions at the moment. I'm sure if I do, I'll probably ask them later when it doesn't really matter so much. But anyways, um, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, yeah, just gratitude as well. Thank you so much for um, asking me to come here. This has been really amazing. And to me, this is a very beautiful experience to be able to share um, what Cho Cherry does and what Cho Cherry is about. Uh, and I just really appreciate listening to both of your insights and also the questions you've asked. Uh, it really gets the gears going in like how can we together, hand in hand, go forward from here. And that, that is really exciting to me. So thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, have the same sentiment. It's nice to share a stage with you all. Uh, Ezra, I was just wondering if you wanted to plug any upcoming projects and let everyone know how to, what they can see. Stay tuned on the Instagram page. <laughs> can, you, can you give us your feed in Instagram for the people that are uh, listening in the audience uh, online or in the public that haven't had a chance to check you out before? Absolutely. So go to Choke Cherry Studios on Instagram, and we post our weekly updates on what we do every week, and then we also post uh, certain actions that we're going to have. We have the um, September 30th... Um, day that we do, the orange shirt day, and then we also have October coming up to do the Brandon Smiley um, Remembrance Walk. So we do a lot of things, and we post them onto our Instagram so that the community can meet us where we're at to do these things together, like I said, hand in hand. So thank you. So I don't know where we are with time. I don't keep time, but I have an intuition about time, and I think it might be five more minutes. Oh, great, great work, you guys. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, I also want to just extend my gratitude uh, to all of you, these excellent panelists that I have uh, personally uh, met in different random uh, occasions, some longer than others, and we haven't had a chance to just sit in a living room and talk uh, candidly about issues of, of importance and issues that matters to the community. We are in all this together and we have to support one another. And it is very important to the, also the, the senior artists that are not represented here, also to understand that there's space for them and then there's room for the senior artists too and there, there's uh, opportunities for all us to come together, the commercial artists, the hobbyists, all the people that are in the crafts. We have to do it ourselves because it's not gonna come from any other enterprise and we are in this together. There's changes coming and it's very positive. I'm very grateful again for Jesse to create in this panel and giving me the opportunity to moderate uh, this, this afternoon with all of you and Art Now for putting it together and all the sponsors that might be 20 and I don't know, don't have them in hand, but thank you all. The audience online and every person that make time in this beautiful day outside afternoon, probably one of the last days of the, of the summer fall that we can be out wearing shorts and, and enjoying the day. You just make time and we're here with us listening and uh, these conversations about art. So thank you again. It is, there's a lot of things coming and I think uh, with the conversations uh, that Alexa just posted about the arena and the space for artists, I think it is very important to acknowledge that there's a lot of artists that has been displaced for the last uh, 10 years at least in the city. There's not a lot of affordable studios for artists. I know there's a group that was working uh, art space was working uh, to sort of uh, find a location that they could be uh, create that home space workspace uh, but it hasn't been successful they still working but we have to support these initiatives we have to work together we have to we depend on on on, on businesses like like Levi with all his uh, <laughs> 
enterprises the diversity of his portfolio and also him as, as a community member that, as you have heard, he has supported in his, in his also in his role as a private enterprise. They're not the enemies, they're sitting with us, they're with us also working. They just have, we just have to understand and give the place to know that there's, there's certain boundaries in all of our places and it's good to just respect those boundaries and cross them sometimes when it's needed. So thank you for modeling that to others. You're a young artist and, and a very well artist and I hope you keep doing your work. And, and same for you, Ezra, it's been a pleasure. It's great to see your passion, it's great to see your focus, it's great to see your intention in the work that you do and how many people you touch and you reach with the work that your group, your youth does. Thank you for listening to them and to providing them a the safe place that is so needed and engaging all, their, all the communities are welcome there. So thank you for that. And Alexa, it's always sweet and nice to see your, your face in the community and all the work you do with BAM, with the Craft Council and all the hats that you wear, the ones that you make and the ones that are <laughs> you don't make that are just given to you. You do a great job and it's, it's also very appreciated. And Jesse, again, we met a long time ago and it's just great to have you curating and it's an honor that you just thought of all of us to be with you here just candidly again sharing this time so a big thank you a big applause for the panelists and a big applause to <laughs> our technical lady as well sorry i forgot your name but thank you and the audience i hope you just see it and repeat it and, and see it all over and over because there's a lot of good conversations and good topics here and i hope this trigger new conversations about issues that are important to talk about so thank you and good afternoon everybody <laughs>